Images from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter have shocked scientists by showing that the Moon, the Earth's natural satellite, is steadily decreasing, resulting in creases on its crust and many moon quakes. With a series of missions starting this month, NASA's Artemis program will take humans back to the Moon for the first time in more than 50 years. Additionally, NASA intends to build a base camp somewhere among the Moon's South Pole's angular rocks and grey dust. So why is it that NASA is dying to get back to the Moon as soon as possible? What are the plans for making a permanent Moon base? And if the Moon is really shrinking, what does this mean for future astronauts that will call this tiny world their home? Let's find out. Due to the gradual loss of its internal heat, the Moon is shrinking. The Moon kept a tremendous amount of heat when it formed over 4 billion years ago. But because of its small size, that heat gradually escaped into space. When an object emits heat into the environment, it causes the object to both expand and to contract. That's what the Moon is experiencing. The Moon shrinks as it ages because it gradually loses heat. The Moon shrinks more quickly when it contains more heat, thus, as time passes, its rate of shrinkage slows down. Temperature variations can result in the cracking of some items. Ice can break and crack when the temperature becomes warmer. A glass cup might also break and crack if you wash it in an environment with too high a temperature. This is because objects expand and shrink as a result of temperature changes. Similarly, the Moon is literally cracking because it is shrinking from heat loss. Moonquakes are caused by the Moon shrinking, despite the fact that the Moon will never break. Because the Moon's surface is fragile, periodic tearing that resembles earthquakes is unavoidably caused by the Moon's surface decreasing. On the other hand, moonquakes are incredibly feeble and lack even the tiniest earthquake level of power. How we view the nearest planet to Earth has changed as a result of the discovery of moonquakes and fault lines. Although we typically think of the Moon as a lifeless, arid planet, it actually has a lot going on there. Even though the Moon changes slowly and moonquakes are mild, it serves as a reminder that appearances can be deceptive. The Moon is a dynamic location, and it is hoped that humanity will return there soon to learn more about this unique world. We are going. That was the catchphrase NASA was using leading up to the first launch of its new moon rocket, which was scheduled for last Monday. However, after cancelling a scheduled launch last Saturday, NASA has postponed any further attempts to launch the Artemis lunar mission until at least September 19th. On Monday morning, the initial attempt by the space agency to launch this rocket had to be aborted because a sensor indicated that one of the rocket's four engines didn't appear to be cooling down to the required temperature of roughly minus 420 degrees Fahrenheit. Officials stated that it was obvious the engine was actually OK and a sensor was providing a misleading temperature reading after researching the issue and troubleshooting. Then on Saturday, as crews were working to refuel the rocket, they then discovered a leak of liquid hydrogen, which required them to pause and restart the fueling procedure numerous times. Before falling so far behind schedule that Blackwell Thompson ultimately waved off the launch, NASA made three fruitless attempts to fix the leak. Sending humans back to the moon can seem like a big yawn to someone who is not into space. Why? We already went. Given that it will be several years before humans set foot on the Moon, and by that time NASA will have spent nearly $100 billion, why should it replicate what it did 50 years ago? In their current arguments, NASA officials claim that the lunar missions are an integral part of their human spaceflight program and are not just a repetition of the Apollo moon landings from 1969 to 1972. It's a future where NASA will land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon, Bill Nelson, the NASA administrator, said during a news conference this month. And on these increasingly complex missions, astronauts will live and work in deep space and will develop science and technology to send the first humans to Mars. That represents a shift from President Barack Obama's 2010 speech at the site of the American moon landing, 
where he advocated for NASA to expand beyond the Moon and aim for more ambitious destinations like asteroids and Mars. NASA officials gave the current program the moniker Artemis while it was under the Trump administration. Artemis was Apollo's identical twin sister in Greek mythology. The program's first step is the forthcoming space launch system test flight, which will have the Orion capsule, where people will travel during subsequent missions on top. This uncrewed journey, during which Orion will orbit the Moon and then return to Earth, is intended to iron out any kinks in the craft before astronauts board it. In addition to using the mission as a testing ground for technologies required for a much longer journey to Mars, NASA also hopes to jumpstart businesses looking to establish a steady business of launching scientific instruments and other payloads to the Moon and to encourage students to major in science and engineering. These days, the desire to visit the Moon is not limited to NASA. China has accomplished three successful robotic lunar landings in recent years. In 2019, Israeli and Indian NGOs sent landers, but they both crashed. An orbiter from South Korea is on its way. The astronauts' collection of rocks during the Apollo missions fundamentally altered how the solar system was perceived by planetary scientists. Different portions of the Moon's surface were precisely dated through the analysis of radioactive isotopes. According to the information found in the rocks, the Moon may have formed from debris that was flung into space when a Mars-sized object slammed into Earth 4.5 billion years ago. But for 20 years following Apollo 17, the final Moon landing, NASA ignored the Moon, which seemed to be a barren, lifeless planet to many. It began to pay more attention to other parts of the solar system, such as Mars and the numerous moons of Jupiter and Saturn. However, interest in the Moon among scientists never completely vanished. Rocks that hardened billions of years ago are still in nearly pristine shape because of the area's desolate environment. Additionally, researchers found that the Moon is not as arid as previously believed. Water is a precious resource that is frozen at the bottom of the craters that are perpetually dark. Water can be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen, making it a potential source of drinking water for future astronauts traveling to the Moon. Breathable air may be produced by oxygen, and oxygen and hydrogen could also be used as rocket fuel. As a result, before leaving the solar system, spaceships may stop at the Moon or a refueling facility in orbit around the Moon to refuel. If the ices were old accumulations from many billions of years ago, they might even offer a scientific account of the solar system's past. The newfound interest in the Moon was sparked by expanding knowledge of the ice. Then NASA issued a request for suggestions for a spacecraft that would accompany the impending Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission to the Moon. Dr. Kolopreet proposed the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, or LCROSS, which he believed could confirm indications of water ice that had been picked up by a few lunar spacecraft in the 1990s. At the time, Dr. Kolopreet was primarily involved with climate models of Mars. At a speed of 5,600 miles per hour, LCROSS would drive the top stage of the rocket that carried out the mission into one of the polar craters, after which a small follow-up spacecraft would measure the debris that was ejected. However, NASA liked the concept and chose it. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and LCROSS were launched by a rocket in June 2009. In the Cabeus crater, not far from the south pole of the Moon, LCROSS performed its fatal dive that October. Dr. Kolopreet received his response a month later. There was water at the bottom of Cabeus, and quite a bit of it. Scientists have discovered water trapped in the minerals of ancient Apollo 15 and Apollo 17 rocks using cutting-edge techniques, as well as instruments on the Indian orbiter Chandrayaan-1 but there are a lot of unsolved issues for scientists. 
There are frigid areas with ice and chilly areas that don't seem to have any ice. The two regions do not always overlap, with some sites having ice below the surface while others having frost at the surface. We're not really sure how or when that water got there. This implies that neither the quantity of water present nor the ease with which it can be drawn from the surrounding rock and soil is genuinely known to scientists. Additionally, Dr. Kolapreet continues to work on the moon. In the previous two decades, he claimed the community has developed. The Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, or VIPER, a robotic vehicle that will land close to the South Pole in late 2024 and explore some of the dark craters to get a closer look while digging a meter into the ground, now has him as its lead investigator. Understanding the origin and types of water on the Moon is one of our main objectives, according to Dr. Kolapreet. Humans could resume moonwalking by the end of this decade. In advance of that, NASA intends to build up a base camp somewhere among the Moon's South Pole's gloomy dust and jagged rocks. The Artemis missions will eventually break Apollo 17's record for the longest stay on the Moon, 74 hours, 59 minutes and 38 seconds, thanks to this lunar outpost, which will also act as a base for more extensive research. According to NASA, the camp would initially only support missions lasting a week or two, but as it expands and becomes more sophisticated, the agency wants to support troops for up to two months at a time. According to current ideas, a lunar cabin, an open-top rover like the ones used on Apollo's missions, and anything resembling an RV that would give mobility and enable astronauts to live and work away from the base for days or weeks at a period are all being considered. The Artemis program schedule has gotten a little longer since its launch in 2019. The initial version of the base camp was supposed to be established by 2030, but according to an internal planning document obtained by the news outlet Ars Technica, it might really take place in 2034. Although it may seem far off, teams of scientists and engineers are already working diligently to realize the ambition of putting humans on the moon. The South Pole provides astronauts with two essential components for a lunar base. Periods of constant sunlight and deep craters with depths that have been covered in darkness for billions of years. The South Pole of the Moon sees up to two months of continuous light each year as a result of the Moon's tilt with respect to the Sun, with the Sun circling just above the horizon the entire time. The Artemis Base Camp can generate enough solar electricity with all this sunlight. To make the most of the available sunshine, NASA is currently looking into systems that support a solar array more than 30 feet in the air. The same tilt that gives the lunar poles months of uninterrupted illumination also causes some of the Moon's craters to have shaded regions that haven't seen the Sun since the crater was formed. Permanently shaded zones like these are extremely cold and gloomy, craters where researchers have discovered signs of water ice. If this frozen water turns out to be readily available and abundant, it will be extremely beneficial for the people living at Artemis Base Camp, as well as for refueling missions to Earth or Mars. How? Since water can be used as a propellant, it can also power spaceflight. Ben Bussey, the director of NASA's Lunar Surface Innovation Initiative, based at John Hopkins University, says that if further research reveals there is no water on the Moon, then lowering the cost of rocketing payloads between Earth and the Moon will become the key to establishing a lunar base camp. In other words, it would need to become much more affordable to transport everything from Earth to the Moon that is required to build and supply the base. The first significant step toward building a base camp will be the Lunar Terrain Vehicle, LTV, which is expected to launch on a mission sometime after Artemis 3 in 2025. Although the autonomy and remote control capabilities of the LTV are significant innovations, its basic architecture isn't anticipated to differ significantly from the rovers that came before it. 
The Open Top LTV requires astronauts to put on their spacesuits in order to operate it, which is where NASA's idea for a lunar mobile home enters completely uncharted ground from an engineering perspective. The pressurized interior of NASA's RV-like design, known as the Habitable Mobility Platform, will contain life support systems, allowing occupants to comfortably travel within without spacesuits on. As putting on a spacesuit can take hours and is not always pleasant, this makes life easier for the astronauts. It also implies that crewed ventures across the lunar surface can continue longer and travel farther than ever before. The aim is to enable numerous astronauts to live and work inside the vehicle for up to two weeks. But the final design for the RV hasn't been decided upon, so experts can't predict what it will look like. Since science fiction has been imagining what homes in space might look like for decades, the lunar cabin is ready to capture the attention of the entire world. Although the design has not been completed, NASA is considering the use of inflatable and modular structures to build bigger, more transportable, habitable habitats on the Moon. NASA is trying to extract oxygen, which is unexpectedly abundant in lunar rocks and metals like aluminum from the Moon, in addition to collecting water and construction materials from it. All of this is part of the process of learning to live off the land on the Moon, so that a base there could be more self-sufficient and act as a resupply station for spacecraft headed to Mars. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.